Good morning, everyone. I'm Philip James, and today's guest is Dr. Michael Tuttle. Good morning, Dr. Tuttle. Good morning. And our topic this morning is active surveillance and the Sesame Street explanation of thyroid cancer. And how did we come up with that title? Because somebody listened to Dr. Tuttle's most recent interview on the Dr. Thyroid podcast and ended up speaking with Dr. Tuttle. And Dr. Tuttle, he described it as, oh my God, I went into this meeting with so much anxiety and I came out of it feeling so much better. And the way he described it was like the Sesame Street explanation. So, uh, you know, patients uh, always, you have a way of, during the worst of anxiety, making people feel calm. Uh, Dr. Tuttle, can you please share a little bit about your background and experience? Absolutely. Thanks, Philip, for inviting us back here again. The, I, I think the Sesame Street comment is the ultimate compliment, right? You know, uh, part of our job is to try to make things not more complicated so we look smart, but make things where people can understand it. So for me, people often say I make complicated things relatively simple, and I always seem that, to me, that's the highest compliment. So I, I love the Sesame Street example. Uh, so I'm Mike Tuttle. I'm the Chief of Endocrinology at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I've uh, been at Memorial for more than 20 years now. My entire career in endocrinology for the last 30 years has been managing and evaluating thyroid cancer. Um, early in my career, mostly the really aggressive thyroid cancers and systemic therapy. And over the last 10 to 15 years, evolving toward more of the lower risk thyroid cancers. Um, not to minimize the low risk experience because thyroid cancer is thyroid cancer, but it behaves differently. And so our group at Memorial and now, as you mentioned over the last two years, multiple groups around the world have been exploring what's the best way to take care of these small thyroid cancers that we're finding. Um, I've got the wonderful opportunity to work inside a, a fantastic disease management group where this is a group of about 30 or 40 of us that study thyroid cancer, all working in the same building and on the same floor, um, and has allowed us to sort of push the edge a little bit and say, do we really need to treat this? Or when do we treat this? And when should we watch? Um, and asking questions that we never would have asked 10 years ago. I mean, we would have never asked the question, should we treat this thyroid cancer? Of course we should, it's cancer, it should be treated. And now people are starting to say, well, wait a minute, are we finding some cancers that may actually not need to be treated or not need to be treated now? And so that's the area that we've really sort of focused in on, trying to make sure that we get the right treatment to the right patient, not over-treating, but just as importantly, not under-treating. Mm -hmm. And like Einstein said, the ability to make the complex simple is pure genius, is genius. <laughs> so it really is an art and you, do have a way when speaking uh, with patients of uh, making what can be a, just a super high anxiety diagnosis when, when the patient hears the word cancer, uh, bringing calm to the situation and translating the complex into simple. Yeah, well, it is scary, right? I mean, uh, nobody ever personally thought they had a low risk thyroid cancer. If it's mine, it's scary and I'm worried about it. Um, you know, but I think when you come to a center like ours, where this is what we do every day, uh, we know what this looks like. I'm not nervous about how to treat it. We, our whole team knows how to treat this. And, and patients kind of feel that when they come into us. They, they often ask, uh, how many of these have you seen? Uh, and one of my fellows a couple of years ago, when the patient asked, how many of these have you seen? My fellow very naively asked, do you mean today or do you mean this week or this year? <laughs> I mean, wow. she, didn't real, she didn't realize what she was saying, but it was the seventh or eighth person with the observation we were seeing the same day. And, and the patient just took a deep breath and started to laugh and said, I don't need the number. You, you answered my question. So I, I think familiarity and, you know, expertise, it's like anything else. The, the more of it you do, the more comfortable that you get. And, you know, after you've explained it for 10 years, you better get better at explaining it. So I think that helps. Well, it looks like we have uh, people tuning in. Uh, so thank you to everyone for tuning in. Looks like Latin America is definitely joining us. We have Colombia and Honduras. Um, for those tuning in, please post your questions. And because this is a shorter interview, 
if we don't get to your question during the live broadcast, Dr. Tuttle said he will respond to you in the comments and type an answer to your question. And while we're presenting today, I'll go ahead and flash some of your questions across the screen. Uh, Dr. Tuttle, before moving forward and kind of taking a deeper dive into what has changed in regard to active surveillance in the past two years, let's define it for the audience. What is active surveillance? Yeah, so the active surveillance is the terminology that, that came out of Japan with uh, Professor Miyachi's group out of Kuma, Japan. I mean, it's this idea that there are some very small thyroid cancers that don't need an immediate treatment. Um, uh, when we talk to patient groups, patients are starting to like the term active monitoring better than active surveillance because active monitoring sort of is more reflective of what it is. And that usually is instead of rushing to a surgery and properly selected patients, we do an ultrasound maybe every six months for two years to see if that little thyroid cancer is changing. Um, this has been done not only in thyroid cancer, it's done in some leukemia, it's just done some, in some other cancers as well. But the general concept is our technology has gotten so good that we can find very small thyroid cancers that don't need immediate treatment. And the real key to this is you have to be certain that if you don't do immediate treatment and somebody needs treatment in a year or two years or five years, <clears throat> that that delay doesn't cause any harm that the treatment works just as well a year from now, two years from five years from now. So it's this concept of finding generally small cancers, and in our case, thyroid cancers, that we may have never known about in our entire life, but we find them, we know about them, the patient knows it's a cancer, and we begin to have the conversation, sure, we could do surgery and take it out now, but is there any hurry to do that? And we can actively monitor you over the years and intervene should that become necessary. I've become a real proponent to active surveillance because I had a thyroidectomy and everything that could have gone wrong did. So paralyzed vocal cord, ruined parathyroids, nerve damage, uh, so on and so forth. So it was through that then when I started hearing about uh, active surveillance or active monitoring as patients are saying now. Um, of course, part of me says, I wish that would have happened. And you mentioned Dr. Miyauchi in Kobe, Japan. There'll be a link to his interview in the description to this broadcast, but had a chance to sit down with him a couple of times in Japan. And in when he shares information, you know, he like he said, some people, many people actually in the Finnish study die with thyroid cancer, not from. Yeah. So, so uh, Akira is a great friend. Um, and I will tell you, our program at Memorial was built off his shoulders. Um, he allowed me to come to his center and spend time with him. Um, and some of the early papers that we wrote about how to do active surveillance in the United States, he co-authored with me because it seemed ridiculous for me to write this about a hundred patients when he's done a thousand. So he's been a phenomenal mentor and help to us. Um, he's exactly right. If you look in most autopsy series of people that die for some other reason, about 10% of people have a small thyroid cancer. Um, the analogy is sort of none of us are surprised if an old man has prostate cancer, right? We know us old guys, a small number of us have prostate cancer, and many times it doesn't need to be treated. And so they do active surveillance in that situation as well. Um, if you do thyroid surgeries for any other reason, not a cancer reason, about 10% of the time you find a little small thyroid cancer. Now, 10% is a huge number. That means one out of every 10 of your friends, one out of every 10 has thyroid cancer and thank God they don't know about it. If they knew about it, good Lord, we'd be over treating tons of them. So the picture is we've got this background level of thyroid cancer that seldom hurts people. And yet some of those grow. Um, and so knowing that there's that background, that's what led Dr. Miucci to say, we may be finding stuff that doesn't need to be treated and thinking about, well, how do we figure out which ones need to be treated? And the answer was that they would grow over a few years. If they remain stable, then you could continue to follow. And that's where he developed that concept of active surveillance. Last time I sat with him, and it's just always nice to sit with him in his office and he just presents these 
this is his latest research on active surveillance. And one we mentioned last time, now this was two years ago, but he said they've been observing patients that do have a, a, a nodule, uh, they, they shrink in some cases. Yeah, but if you would have asked me 15 years ago, Philip, I'd have told you that was crazy. We know cancer doesn't shrink. Um, and we reported the same thing, somewhere between seven and 10% of these small papillary thyroid cancers shrink over the years. Um, and once we reported it, other people said, well, we thought that was just us being wrong. And now everybody reports the same thing. Now, these are after a biopsy and they're generally small. So I think in some of them, the biopsy probably damaged most of the cancer. You know, you stick the needle in there, you damage the blood supply. So I think in some of them, the biopsy is probably what made them shrink. But in other ones, they've slowly shrank over years. Um, and whether that's the patient's immune system or the natural history. When we first saw this phenomenon, uh, my nurse practitioner interrogated the patients that were shrinking and say, tell me what you were doing. It, it turns out my patients are the worst research subjects on the planet because they all do 25 things at the same time. Um, mm. they, they use every herb I've never heard of. They do something called exercise that I don't know what it is. They eat a, <laughs> they eat a healthy diet. They, they make all of these changes. So much sure. so that when I lecture around the world, I no longer call my group of patients observation patients. I call them self-therapy patients. So they're not rejecting treatment. They're just rejecting my treatments. So we have not been able to find any common theme because everybody always asks me, good Lord, tell me why they shrink. Um, but there is no question that that's a common phenomenon. And if you look at the real data, the almost as many shrink as grow. A about 10% grow over a few years and about 10% shrink. So that is a, a, an absolutely true phenomenon that we're yet to understand. You said you do the screening to qualify whether um, a thyroid cancer could be observed. And what is entailed in that screening? Yeah. So the, the real secret, um, if there is a secret to how the active surveillance programs work, whether it's in Kuma Hospital or us or Pisa, Italy or Buenos Aires or Rio de Janeiro, all places that have observation programs, the key is selecting the patients. Um, we really talk about sort of three things that we talk about. One, what are the patient characteristics? Um, are they willing to follow? Some people are not. They just want surgery. They want it out of their body. That's perfectly fine. What's the medical team characteristics? How good are the ultrasonographers? What kind of expertise does the medical team have? And then the third one is sort of what are the characteristics of the ultrasound? And I'll show you in a in a slide that we can show here in a second, that location matters. Um, there are sometimes you have small thyroid cancers in a bad location, right near that nerve that goes to the voice box or right near the windpipe, where even a little growth would get you in trouble. That's not a good one to watch. Other ones are way out to the side of the thyroid or in the middle part of that. So with actually Dr. Miachi, one of the first papers we wrote years ago with him, we talked about figuring out how somebody was ideal, appropriate, or inappropriate for observation. So ideal, appropriate, or inappropriate. And we've worked up definitions for that for people to see uh, so that you can look at it. Because the last thing you wanna do is follow somebody that's inappropriate. Somebody that's inappropriate for watching means they need a surgery or they need an intervention because that's really critical so they don't get hurt. The appropriate ones are kind of in the middle. We can watch, there's some risks, there's some benefits, you'd have to have a discussion with me. And then the ideal ones are easy. Those are usually the older patients with really, really small thyroid cancers that I usually start the consultation by apologizing that we found this. Um, I'm really sorry I made you a cancer patient. Somebody biopsied a little teeny thyroid cancer in a 90 year old, uh, that, that was not helpful. So there are, there are clinical frameworks now that we've helped publish for clinicians to understand who's the right people to follow and who's not the right person to follow. And part of this is really depending on the patient too, because there is a, I will say as a thyroid cancer patient, there's kind of a stigma. Um, you know, even if you're filling out a job application, depending on what the questions are, uh, you just you don't want someone to know that you have cancer. 
I think is a perception, is a patient. I'll speak for myself. It's a perception of weakness. So a lot of patients I'll talk to during the podcast will say, oh, no, if I uh, am diagnosed with cancer, I want it out. And then I almost grab them by the arm and, and lock them up and say, listen, if you take the thyroid out, your life is not going to be the same. Mm -hmm. but I think it really is a matter emotionally, mentally for a patient. Uh, what kind of patient are there? How do they perceive risk? How much will their partner in life look at them either with a pat on the back, congratulations, you didn't do surgery, or what are you doing? Why didn't you do surgery? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right on the money. I didn't understand this 10 years ago. Um, that I'm a pretty good used car salesman, so I, I think I can talk most people into what I want them to do. Um, but I'd run into folks that were like, you know, nice chat. Thanks for telling me about active surveillance. When can I see the surgeon? Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at all of our data, whether it's Professor Miachi's or ours, it turns out even in folks that would be good candidates to watch, only half of them choose to watch. The other half choose surgery. Mm -hmm. So I often start this consultation by saying, look, I think there are two right answers here. One right answer is surgery. One right answer is watching. Clearly, I lean toward watching because I'm a minimalist kind of person. And I think that's affected because I get to see everybody with the complications. That's who comes sees me. If you have an easy surgery and nothing happens, guess what? I never see you. So my bias is kind of like yours. Um, but we talk about the risk and the benefits and the pros and cons. We've run into over the years a few unexpected things. Like somebody wanted to watch and she wanted to donate a kidney to her brother for kidney transplant. And they mm -hmm. wouldn't do it until we took the thyroid out. Um, I had two or three other patients that I was watching, been stable for years, but they needed an organ transplant and they couldn't get it until we treated their thyroid cancer. I've had a few people run into long-term insurance issues. They wanted mm -hmm. to buy more life insurance, but the rules are you have to be cancer free for five years, but you're not cancer free if I'm watching you. So there are some of those sort of subtle things that may be more US centric than anything, but those are, those are real issues. And there are definitely family pressures. Um, I've had a few patients that really wanted to watch, but their family, their mom or dad, their spouses, their doctors, they, they just put so much pressure on them that we took it out. So I think when we talk about this, we don't talk about it as right and wrong. There are two right answers. There's pros and cons to both. And I want folks after they leave my consult to understand the pros and cons of surgery, the pros and cons of active surveillance. And while I say there's two right answers for any individual patient, there's one right answer. So I'll present them with two right options. And then they help me figure out for them what's going to be their best um, way to follow. You said the word minimalist. Can you please uh, define for the minimalist and maximalist? <laughs> Yeah, this was phenomenal work done by uh, Pam Hartspan up at Harvard. Pam's an endocrinologist up there. Um, and she was looking at what she called medical decision making and how people make decisions. Um, and as I was starting to see patients after the first 50 or 100, I was starting to describe people as, boy, they just want everything done. Or, well, they really don't want to do anything unless it's necessary. Uh, and I was giving grand rounds at Harvard and uh, met with Pam afterwards. And she said, let me show you a book that I just wrote. And she had described this concept of minimalist and maximalist, um, that there are some people mm -hmm. that as soon as they find out they have a medical condition, they want it treated. Cancer, get it out. Blood sugar, one point above normal, put me on pills. Mm -hmm. Cholesterol, one point above normal, put me on pills. Mm -hmm. And then there are people like me that, yeah, the blood sugar is a little bit high. And I swear, doc, I'll, I'll, I'll follow my diet. I'll, I'll be better. I'll do good. Cholesterol is too high. Eh, don't put me on pills yet. I'd rather do this myself. It's that self-therapy kind of thing. Now, minimalists are not idiots and minimalists are not stupid. Um, if a minimalist needs a surgery and you explain to them why, what are the risks and benefits? They will go do that. So the, but I, I find that sort of, paradigm works really well as I'm starting to think about people and as I'm listening to them during the consults and we're talking, I'm trying to pick up things where I can, they're telling me sort of in not uncertain words that they're worried about the complications. They're worried about living without a thyroid. They had a friend that had their thyroid out and gained a hundred pounds, or they had a terrible experience with another surgery or, you know, all of those things sort of frame into 
if you've got two right answers, why one person would choose surgery and could never understand why anybody would watch mm -hmm. and another person would choose to watch and could never understand why anybody would want surgery. Mm -hmm. So as we kind of uh, are coming close to the end here, a few more questions coming in. Uh, we will get to those questions, uh, Dr. Tata will, uh, after this uh, live episode. But if you could please share a little bit about the latest developments about uh, active surveillance, especially in light of some new technology like molecular profiling and RFA and how those technologies impact this topic. Yeah, these are great. I'm glad we got here because these are sort of the new things. Um, so let's do them se uh, two separately. One is sort of the molecular testing, and then we'll talk about the new fancy ways to kill these little places. Um, the, I always get questions about, should we have fancy molecular testing done to help me predict which ones are going to grow or not grow? Um, and right now the answer is no. Um, I have access to every freaking molecular test in the planet at Memorial, right? I mean, we're an ivory tower. I could do 400 gene things if I wanted to. And it turns out I don't need it. Um, the vast majority of these, when we try to watch, when we pick people appropriately, about 90% are not going to grow. They're going to be exactly the same over time. About 10% grow. And if you're one of that 10% that has one of those funny genes that I don't know about, it's going to be a little bit bigger in six months or a little bit bigger in a year, and we're going to take it out. So right now, we're not using the molecular profiling to either rule in or rule out. People always ask about BRAF. We watch lots and lots of folks with little small ones with BRAF. That doesn't take you out of the observation program. Um, so from a molecular standpoint, the good news is for the United States and the rest of the world, that's not necessary. The same pattern that Professor Miachi has done for 20 years, which is just the ultrasound. Um, I don't have to predict the future. Just give me two years. I'll tell you what it is. Uh, molecular be predicting, right? I don't need to predict. Uh, we'll tell you in six months or a year if it's changing. Um, I think the really exciting thing that's still experimental for right now, but I think will be a very good standard of care option in the next couple of years, are thermal ways or heating ways to destroy these little places. Because patients always ask me, can you not take my whole thyroid out? Can you have the surgeon just take out the thyroid cancer? And technically we can't do that because it causes too much bleeding. But there's been a variety of technologies where basically you stick a needle into it, just like you did the biopsy, stick a needle into it, but leave the needle there and then heat up something at the end of the needle, either with lasers or radio frequency ablation or microwave. Um, the Mayo Clinic is injecting a little bit of alcohol in there. So these are all techniques to destroy just that little place. And for a lot of people, they find that attractive because then they can say, my cancer's been treated. <laughs> Now, it doesn't treat the rest of the thyroid. you got to keep an eye on the rest of the thyroid. Um, again, you have to be very selective because you can't have one of those in a place where the heating would damage a nerve or a trachea. But I think over the next couple of years, uh, I suspect many people will have three right answers. One is going to be active surveillance. One is going to be a traditional thyroid surgery. And the third is going to be one of these ablation technologies that can be done as an outpatient. It doesn't destroy the rest of the thyroid. There's none of the complications of a surgery. You don't go on thyroid hormone pills. Now, we do want to sound a note of caution because I don't want 10% of the U.S. population getting a ultrasound-guided treatment of something that doesn't need to be treated. Um, so in our place, I'm using it experimentally for people that don't yet um, want to watch, but they want something treated. Um, and in my folks that we started watching, and it's growing slowly. In that group of patients, instead of moving to a surgery, we're thinking about moving to one of these technologies. So that, that's exciting to think about in, in probably less than a year or two, that we'll have three right answers to these little, small, properly selected cancers and not just two. As we are at the end here, just three quick questions. The first one's probably not too quick, but I've talked to some surgeons that say, no way. If I discover a thyroid cancer in a patient, I want to take it out because I don't want to worry about a lawsuit down the road. How do you respond to them? Don't worry about it. The, you know, that was more of an issue of 10 years ago. Um, now the guidelines, this is becoming common practice. So I think the real key is you have to tell people that there are two options. There's a surgical option. There's a watching option. Um, if you think the patient, we see this a lot. The surgeons are not comfortable outside of Memorial following themselves. 
but they'll say, go to Memorial. They'll do it down there. So uh, at this, I, I'm much less worried about that now than it was five or 10 years ago, uh, because now this is really becoming a part of medical practice as long as you properly select the patients. And now to peer into your life a little bit, we know you're, or I know you're an avid piano player, pianist. Uh, what, are you, what are you reading these days? Any books that you uh, are enjoying? <laughs> oh, that's great. The, uh, yeah, so I, uh, I, I drive back and forth to Manhattan most days, about an hour or so. So I, I listen to stuff on video. Um, I'm an old historical person. So I'm actually re-listening to all the president's men about Watergate. Uh, so I like historical and historical fiction sorts of things. Um, and I also just assumed the job of chief of endocrine here over the last year. So every other book is books about management and management style and sort of organizational sort of things, because I'm a country boy that grew up on a little farm. So I have to learn how to be a big city doctor. So I listen to those books to try to figure that out. And as you're driving to work, if there was a big billboard up on the side of the freeway that was about active surveillance, what would the billboard say? Ask your doctor. Ask your doctor. Um, now, if it was under active surveillance at the top or ask your doctor, do I need to be treated? If you open that question up, then that makes the doctor say, okay, this is somebody that's reasonably thinking about this. Um, they're very unlikely to sue me if they ask that question, right? So that you're open to that. Um, I think it's perfectly fair anytime somebody's diagnosed with a thyroid cancer to ask, does this need to be treated? And in our center, my answer most of the time is yes. We found a significant thyroid cancer. That doesn't hurt my feelings. Great question. Yes, this needs to be treated, and here's why. So I think across the medical continuum, whether we're doing thyroid cancer or not, for me personally, you can tell I'm a minimalist, right? So I'm always going to ask that question. Does this need to be treated? And if so, why? If a patient wants to learn more about active surveillance, where would you direct them? I mean, the biggest source these days is like YouTube, right? I used to send people to uh, channels uh, and books and all that sort of stuff. Um, most of the big medical uh, centers like us and the Mayo Clinic and Hopkins and those sorts of places have information about that. Um, okay. There's lots of patient support groups, FICA and Light of Life Foundation. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit out there. Uh, you know, you always take everything you read with a grain of salt and, you know, kind of test it and make sure it's true but lots of information. Uh, many of us have lectured around the world and, and those lectures are now posted up on YouTube and various sites. So I think those are those are great resources to be able to find. Dr. Tyrell, it's always a pleasure. Your humility, you're down to earth. It's no wonder that you really are a favorite of patients. You know, you just have a way of bringing that calmness to a situation when a patient is told they have thyroid cancer and they just, are feeling so much anxiety, you have a way to kind of make a patient feel at ease. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And thank you to 30 years worth of patients that have taught me how to behave. So I think there's <laughs> there's a lot of a two-way street here. You, you have to do things wrong to figure out how to do it right. So maybe I've done it wrong long enough that we're starting to get a little bit of it right. And for everyone listening or watching, all the resources and links will be shared in the show notes or in the description to this video. Thank you to everyone for tuning in. Dr. Tuttle, thank you. Thanks very much, Phil. Great to be here.